chapter 9 today. And you may not know this, but being that this is Palm Sunday, perhaps one of the most definitive passages in this celebration is found right here in the book of Daniel. Daniel was the one who gave us a prophecy of the 70 weeks of years. And the 70 weeks of years prophecy found in this chapter, it is a prophecy that literally gives us to the day when Jesus would ride in to Jerusalem and present himself as king. This is one of the most profound prophecies in Scripture that give us hope for where we are now. And I say that because I've been preaching through the book of Revelation. It's nice to fall back now and go and see things from a bigger perspective than just the book of Revelation because of the last week of years that are put forth in this particular chapter. And it gives us the minutia, play by play. You know, you got the seals, you got the trumpets, you got the bowls, you got the Armageddon, you got the return of the Lord. But here what we have is an aerial view that was presented 500 years before Jesus Christ came into the city. 500 years, right down to the very day. And he gives us the starting point and he gives us the culmination point. And so we're going to look at that together. So if you've got your Bibles open to chapter 9, we're in verse 1. The Bible says, In the first year of Darius, the son of Ahasuerus, of the seed of the Medes, which was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans, in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by books the number of the years whereof the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah the prophet, that he would accomplish 70 years in desolations of Jerusalem. And I set my face unto the Lord to seek by prayer and supplication with fasting and sackcloth and ashes, and I prayed. What you're seeing is the setting up of this revelation to Daniel. And we see that Daniel is startled in some sense to have discovered something. It is a very interesting thing to realize that the Bible tells us that it is the glory of God to conceal a matter, and the glory of a king is to search it out. God had revealed what the timing would be for the captivity of the Israelites in Babylon. He gave them the time. Okay, the the time would be 70 years. That's what was said in Jeremiah chapter 25. The Bible says, "...and this whole land shall be a desolation." And in astonishment, and these nations shall serve the king of Babylon 70 years. So he told them straight up. So if you're reading your Bible, you might know some stuff about what's happening right now. (laughs) Because we've got books telling us what's happening right now. It's kind of exciting, really. I mean, if you can get excited about it. I saw a meme recently of a of two people in a roller coaster and one was leaning in who's a believer. Woo-hoo-hoo, you know, because they're going down, they're excited, man, this is happening. And the other guy's going, ah, and he's freaking out because he's a little younger. He doesn't know anything. And what I'm telling you is, is you and I are living large right now because as they say in the Chronicles of Narnia, Aslan is on the move, okay? There's some stuff going on around us. And it's an exciting time if we know the backstory of everything before us. Jeremiah chapter 25 also says, And it shall come to pass when the 70 years are accomplished that I will punish the king of Babylon in that nation, saith the Lord, for their iniquity in the land of the Chaldeans and will make perpetual desolations. Interestingly enough, there's nothing in Babylon now. Okay, A lot of people uh, you know, remember that uh, Saddam Hussein wanted to rebuild Babylon, but he didn't get very far because God says it was going to be a perpetual desolation. And if we go back and remember that in chapters 17 and 18 of the book of Revelation, that Babylon has fallen, has fallen, you're going to have to stay tuned because we'll get to that if the Lord tarries in our study of the book of Revelation. Jeremiah 29.10 says, For thus says the Lord that after 70 years be accomplished at Babylon, I will visit you and perform my good word toward you in causing you to return to this place. That was five chapters later, okay, practically. So you're looking at a, at, a, at a promise that he would perform his good word, and his good word would be performed to bring them back to their land. You see, even in judgment, God remembers mercy. Isn't that nice to know? He loves his people. And even if there's a believer in your backstory, a child that is wayward or whatever, but you know there was a day when you saw the lights go on in their heart, Man, you can at least go back and say, Lord Jesus, they're in your hands, and and then pray God's will over their lives. 
because there are people that come after many, many moons of alienation back to their father's house. Well, the Bible says in Second Chronicles 36, 21, that this happened to fulfill the word of the Lord spoken by the mouth of Jeremiah until the land had enjoyed her Sabbaths. For as long as she lay desolate, she kept Sabbath to fulfill three score and ten, that's 70 years. Now, I tell you this because you need to recognize something very amazing about God. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He told them how they were to conduct themselves, and they had failed in doing that. The reason that they were 70 years in captivity in Babylon was because for, get this down in your mind, for 490 years, they had failed to keep the Lord's Sabbath rest of the land. Every seventh year, they were supposed to not plow their fields. They were supposed to let the land rest. Was God being mean? No, God was being consistent. And God was letting them know this is a principle you may not understand, but do it anyway. Because when you gave that rest, it gave a chance for the nutrients to come back into their fullest bloom. And they would have bumper crops afterwards. And we now know where God didn't reveal all of this to them at the time. And they didn't know it. But we now know that when you rotate certain crops and certain things, you know, you get down in there and certain crops can rejuvenate. And we don't have to do this. But this was a national, what you might call, ordinance. Just like turning right on red. After you stop. (laughs) Okay, just saying. The law is, after you stop, most places you can turn right on red. That's an ordinance. The Old Testament Pentateuch was largely written to give a a law for a nation. That's what it was for. A lot of people say, what about eating shrimp and all those things? I'm telling you, it's just a law of the nation. That's not on you and me. If you want what's on everybody, you get the big Ten Commandments, and that pretty much covers everything, all right? Now you're talking. Now we can talk about something. We established that law when we come to Jesus. But here what we want to know is that 490 years backstory had to be paid for. And so we get to the time when the Babylonian captivity is afoot, Daniel is taken away. We know all of Daniel's story, but he's now at the end of his tour in Babylon. And he knows that the time for his people to go back is upon them. And as a result of that, he's concerned because he knows they're not ready. Sounds a little bit like our story in the book of Revelation. You get to the end of the church age and you see Laodicea standing there you know, kind of chasing butterflies. They have no clue of what's going on. We have a generation right now that is virtually, biblically illiterate, okay? It's sad, but it's true. And sometimes that's because they've not been taught, because their pastors are biblically illiterate when it comes to the things to come, or it could be just that they just haven't been brought up in church because their parents We're not bringing them or taking them. And I should say taking and bringing them to church because it is how faith is caught. It is caught, not taught. So what we have is we have 490 years backstory, but we're going to find out 490 years are going to be determined against his people. But pay attention to what he says in Daniel chapter 9, verse 2. He says he understood from the books that according to Jeremiah, the 70 years would be accomplished in Jerusalem and that desolations would have been done. So he set his face to pray. Now, guys, listen. This is like a small microcosm of a heavenly hope, okay? They're going to get to go home. (laughs) You can find purchase for your hope. If you go to the Word of God. Right now, things look really bleak. Things look really kind of sinister. The devil's afoot as well. And what's happening is, though, the always winter and never Christmas, it's melting. Okay? Because they're beginning to show their selves for who they are. The problem is, is that the devil is not showing himself to be a black knight. He's showing himself to be a white knight with all kinds of hope being seeded, but not accessed. He's trying to put out there a lot of narratives that make people think this could somehow turn around. And it may very well turn around, but it may be something other than you think. Put that aside for a moment. These people were getting ready to go home. And that was something that was a concern for Daniel because they weren't ready. And if the rapture is almost to take place in our day, you know most people aren't even thinking about that. In fact... You find in your own members as well, as your own self, that sometimes it's hard for you to hang on to the fact that this thing could happen at any minute. And that being said, in the light of all that we see, is really telling for us. 
We live in a day where there's massive amounts of distractions. Work, speed, fast, right? Book of Daniel, chapter 12. In the last days, men shall run to and fro. Knowledge shall increase. And what's happening now is that we might have a little difficulty hanging on to our hope of the upper taker coming to take us out of here because we are overwhelmed with information. And much of it is false. Someone has said, it's not that we don't have enough information, it's we have too much. So you're getting a lot of narratives thrown at you. Makes it very disorienting. But Daniel was like a laser. He was clear. He knew what was going on. And you and I need to aspire to be like the sons of Issachar who understood the times, knowing what we should do. You and I need to be those biblical students who come to God's Word and say, what is going on? Because He's already told us what's going on. And in this passage, he right away went to his face and he began to pray. Now, you've got to understand something about Daniel. He's one of the few people in the Scriptures that does not have one thing laid against him as a breach, some kind of a sin, faux pas, whatever, okay? In fact, he is cataloged with two other characters in the Bible. The Bible says in Ezekiel chapter 14, though these three men, Noah, Daniel, and Job, were in that city, I would not spare it, but their souls only for their righteousness. In other words, these three men are cataloged as being exemplary among the most exemplary among us. Isn't that amazing? I'm so We're looking at Daniel. Daniel, what's he doing? He's praying and he's confessing, verse 4. He says, I prayed unto the Lord and made my confession. What's he say? Verse 5, he says, we have sinned and have committed iniquity, departing from thy precepts and thy judgment, verse 5. Now listen, he knows what's going on with the departing from the judgments. And part of what's going on is the fact that they had not let the land sit fallow for all of those years. Now you have to understand that the leaving of the land fallow for a number of years is actually a keeping of a Sabbath. When you think about the Sabbath, you might take in your mind's eye just the Friday night to Saturday. You know, you got a Sabbath every Friday to Saturday, sundown to sundown. And they would come together as a family, a family, and they would have a Seder meal, and they would commemorate that in six days God created the heavens and the earth, and on the seventh day he rested. But that wasn't the only Sabbath. The other Sabbath was the Sabbath of the land being laid to rest, allowed to rest. And that was a Sabbath they did not keep. How did God feel about that? Well, obviously, 70 years of judgment tells us he was pretty serious about what? His Sabbaths. Do you think God cares about the Lord's Day? Do you think God is taking notes across a nation, across the world? How many people are still remembering him? I want you to understand that when you're thinking about the Sabbath and how this came to bear on these people, Ezekiel had much to say about it. And Ezekiel's one of those earlier prophets like Daniel was. And in chapter 20, he says this in his book, Ezekiel 20, verse 13. He says, But the house of Israel rebelled against me in the wilderness. They walked not in my statutes, and they despised my judgments, which if a man do, he shall even live in them. And my Sabbaths? They have greatly polluted. Then I said, I will pour out my fury upon them in the wilderness to consume them. They had profaned the Sabbaths. Listen, what does it mean to profane the Sabbath? It means to treat it like it is an ordinary thing. We love our Sundays, don't we, in America? It got to the point where all of the sports were playing on Sundays. But you know, COVID kind of put a crimp in that hose, didn't it? 